Okay, so um, welcome everybody to uh, the first talk of the um, attack on research track. Um, <clears throat> we have some kind of technical challenges because um, Arrigo couldn't make it um, to Heidelberg, so we are using WebEx. Um, but it's not the first time in the Troopers history uh, that we have to do that, so I'm pretty sure it will work well. So um, Arriga is from Switzerland, so it's not, uh, not that close, uh, but I'm sure some of you had a, a longer way to Heidelberg. Yeah, and he will give a talk about, um, as far as I uh, have understood uh, for now, um, about influences from the past like nuclear weapons and um, consequences and um, new approaches for information security. So uh, let us welcome Arrigo, and Arrigo, I would like you to start, so please go ahead. Hello, thank you, Michael, for the introduction, and uh, apologies for not being there, but uh, there were constraints. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm not Ed Snowden. I know that these days, whenever there's a someone on the screen, it's meant to be Ed Snowden, but Enno couldn't make the arrangements, so I apologize, you're getting away with me. And uh, what are we talking about? Well, first of all, there's uh, a slide about an RSNDA. Uh, throughout the talk, there is going to be an elephant that I'm not going to be able to mention, and I'm sure you will all be able to figure out what it is. And unfortunately, because I signed uh, something called a uh, restricted secret NDA, which means that I've been told incredible secrets, I will have to reply to any question about it by saying uh, I know nothing about it. It's uh, something I apologize in advance, but I better warn you so you're not disappointed. So there is a plan. First of all, I am going to go through some history some nuclear history, and then I'm going to delve into some firmware, hardware, and discuss a bit about microcode. So, going back to a long, long time ago. As a child, the fun and games were mainly illegal and legal modems. In my specific case, illegal modems imported from the US and acoustic couplers that we use to dismantle and connect directly to the phone line. And we had physical TTYs, uh, 6502 single board computers, and then interesting things like machines running on uh, obscure processors like a Zilog Z8000 16-bit processor. And at the same time, thanks to the acoustic couplers and later the modems, I discovered an interesting BBS in Sofia, which at the time was behind something called the Iron Curtain, which contained interesting assembly code for writing viruses. So this was one of the first toys I used to play with. It's a 6501 single board computer. Sorry, 6502. This one is uh, one of my first Unix machines, a, an Onyx 80002 uh, used to have a 40 megabyte hard disk and supported eight serial terminals, which looked like this. And it happened to be in our living room, uh, to the great joy of my mother, who thought it wasn't uh, exactly what you wanted to show people when you invited them over, especially because it was extremely loud and my father used to get very upset when people used it to uh, hold, uh, you know, coffee cups or wine glasses. So at the same time, uh, the early 80s was the peak of nuclear weapons. And those of you who are old enough to remember, in the 1980s, it was a very hot time in Europe. The Pershing missiles were being um, deployed in Germany. The cruise missiles were being deployed in uh, the south of Italy. And uh, the local population was very upset. In particular, uh, a film, several films were coming out. And different people reacted in different ways. 
And I, in particular, decided that it was very interesting to find out everything possible about nuclear weapons. And my end of year uh, end of year project at the end of the elementary school was about thermonuclear weapons and cruise missiles, to the great joy of my friends. And uh, at the end of the day, I decided it was very interesting to find everything uh, I could about nuclear weapons. And my uh, birthday present when I was 14 by one part of my family was the Italian translation of a brilliant book about understanding nuclear explosions underground by reading the uh, earthquake, um, the seismic readings as if it was an earthquake. And it's very interesting to find out how an underground nuclear explosion differs in seismic reading from a normal earthquake and how you can determine whether or not the explosion has been decoupled, for example. Uh, if you want to know more, you can ask me offline. But it's very interesting, for example, to determine uh, if the North Koreans have a 4 kilo a kiloton bomb or a 15 kiloton bomb, depending on the seismic reading. And... One of the aspects I want to discuss in nuclear warfare is the concept of a decapitation attack. A decapitation attack is when you shoot your nuclear weapons and you hope to get rid of all the command and control structure so that there is no chance of the opposition ordering a retaliation strike. So you can imagine the Russians shoot all their missiles, they get rid of Washington DC, and in theory there is nobody to give the order to the nuclear submarines to shoot their missiles. So the reaction to this is to develop sophisticated means to guarantee the continuity of the command and control structure. So in the US, for example, there is a gigantic list of who is in command if the president is incapacitated. So if the president cannot give the order, then it goes to the vice president. If the vice president cannot give the order, then it goes to the head of the Senate. If the head of the Senate cannot give the order, then it goes down the line until fundamentally your sister can give the order to shoot the missiles. And this goes on and on. Uh, in the US, they basically have a list like that. Other countries took different approaches to the problem. And you might think, why do I care? Well, this has an interesting relevance in computer security. For example, you have a beautiful SOC in your company. Now, a long, long, long time ago, you might remember there was a beautiful intrusion detection system called Black Ice. And at the same time, there was a computer virus which was written, which attacked specifically Black Ice sensors. Now, you might think, why on earth would you want to do that? Well, that is an example of a decapitation attack. If I get rid of your black ice sensors, then suddenly, whatever I shoot down the network, you're not going to be able to see. So similarly, decapitation attacks against your SOC are quite interesting. Now, what was the ultimate plan with respect to decapitation attacks? And here we go to Russia. The Russians invented a system called Perimeter, which was designed in the mid-60s when the Russians discovered that the Americans had more and more accurate missiles, which meant that suddenly they could really say, okay, we're going to shoot a missile which will drop exactly on the Kremlin bunker. And their plan was, if we detect a launch by the Americans, we're going to shoot 30 missiles, which are going to fly all over Russia and broadcast a radio message, which gives the order to launch all our missiles at the same time. That sort of works. But the Americans then said, fantastic. On our first launch, we're going to take out every single launch site at the same time. This is when the uh, number of nuclear weapons in the American arsenal had reached around 12,000. The idea being that you would drop between 100 and 150 weapons on each nuclear launch site to make sure that there was no hope of any missile surviving. But in the end, the Russians had an even better plan. 
The final version, which allegedly is still operating, is totally automated. And it detects the specific parameters. It looks for a radiation burst, gamma burst, blast, the specific flash, which is associated with a nuclear explosion, the total loss of communications, and it automatically initiates a launch sequence for every surviving ICBM missile. And the keyword here is automatically, and it is called a dead hand system. Um, eventually, this was renamed the Doomsday Machine after the famous film Dr. Strangelove by Kubrick. The idea being that the Americans take out Moscow, doesn't matter, the system detects it, allegedly it's in Mount Yamatao in the Urals, the system detects that Moscow has been taken out, and all the remaining Russian missiles are shot towards the Americans. So the message is, you try and kill us, don't worry, we will go, and our robots are going to shoot you back. There is a Western counterpart. The Western counterpart is something called the Letters of Last Resort, which the British came up with. Trust the British to have something very quaint. The Letters of Last Resort are pretty letters written by the Prime Minister when he goes into power. And he writes four letters, one for every missile submarine commander. And the letters are kept secret. They are known only, the content is known only to the Prime Minister. And the Prime Minister says, Dear Commander, if you can no longer hear BBC Radio 4, you can no longer reach the commander, you can no longer reach London, and you assume that the United Kingdom is no longer here, do one of four things. Either retaliate, shooting your missiles, or do not retaliate, find a nice island in the Pacific and go on holiday, or place yourself under your allied command, or, I don't know, do whatever you feel, I'm dead, who cares? So those are the so-called letters of last resort. And they're the British version. So all of this sets the mood for what follows. What happens when you're a young lad and you've spent many, many years reading assembly code on a Bulgarian BBS and you've always thought, this is incredibly cool, I want to write the ultimate backdoor. Well, initially software sounds very interesting. You think, well, I can take the Avengers code, the Dark Avengers code, take a polymorphic virus and make it even more polymorphic so that it becomes even more undetectable. Sure, the code from the Dark Avenger in 1980 is pretty sophisticated. Every time you run it, it looks different. The antiviruses had no clue. They still have no clue, but that is a separate discussion. Problem is, it's software. And eventually, once you have played with software enough, you realize that the real fun starts when you look at hardware. And it so happens that my father is also a hacker, except that he hacks bigger things. And he started working with something called Il Moro di Venezia, which was the Italian America's Cup challenge in the 1990s. And he was the official electronic warfare wizard so his job was, we want to win the America's Cup. You go out, look at all the other boats, and figure out how we can get all their data, using a helicopter, obviously, because why not, and decode the data and figure out how we can beat them. So following my father's footsteps, I decided that since, unfortunately, I couldn't get something as cool as a helicopter, I would attack network cards. And this is the firmware stuff I did previously, which ended up with a Jedi packet trick. So let me introduce my first hack. My first hack is this beautiful printer. Um, most of you have probably never heard of it, but in the 1980s, we had this gorgeous printer called a Prism P80. This was a color dot matrix printer with a completely programmable firmware. It has a processor on it and you could do things like uh, send it text and say, justify it. 
uh, you could tell it to write bold. Um, you could actually ask it to do things like a spell check. So the first thing I hacked on it was, since it only did spell checking in English, I set up a small spell checker for Italian. So you sent it the text, and if you had made basic Italian mistakes, it would correct it before printing. It was extremely cool, I thought, in the day. So this was my first hack. Now, going back to sailing boats, the beauty of El Moro di Venezia was that the first thing they told my father is, your budget is infinite. Now, if you're told your budget is infinite, that's nice. And they tell you, just go and find out how to make this sailing boat go faster than someone else's sailing boat. So the easy way of doing is you fly a helicopter over someone else's training area. And if you're in Italy and the other guys train in New Zealand, what do you do? Well, easy. You get, an, you get an airplane, you fly over there with your whole crew, you loan three helicopters, you fly over, you know, easy things. Your budget is infinite. So what's the big deal? And then you loan a big computer because it's the 1990s. So, you know, what's a big sun between me and you or, you know, a large alpha? Nothing. So you get yourself an alpha, you, comp you put the stuff in, you simulate it, but it's incredibly boring. And your budget is infinite. So what do you do? You do something cooler. So you take your own sail, you cover it in sensors. So what you do is you actually build a factory near Venice that makes specific sail material, so sail fabric with embedded sensors in it. And you feed real-time sensor data to a computer, which you build inside the hull of the sailing boat. You stick my father in the sailing boat to program the computer while it's running. And as the boat is sailing during the tests, he relays the information to the guys sailing the boat and gives them the shape of the sail in real time compared to the models, which give them the optimal speed. And the net result is you reach the finals of the America's Cup. So why did they lose? Ha, ah, good question. The answer is, not my father's fault. But you see where I caught the firmware bug. Now, the mathematics was mine. The physics was my dad. So I guess it's probably my maths. But what happens next is I went off to network cards. So the network cards were an accidental uh, interest. They were started because I bought a, a power book and the PowerBook had a Broadcom card. It gave bad checksums on TCP dump, and the rest is history. At the same time, uh, EFI was a rising star. And one of the new entries in my house was a 2006 iMac. I had read about EFI. So I thought, well, let's find out what we can do with option ROMs. And this was the start of a project called Bushu, which was a mix of EFI and modifications of microcode on the iMac. The problem was it wasn't working very well. So I went back to the drawing board. The drawing board goes back again to my father and his work on bit slicing processors. So this is where we begin. And the beginning is microcode updates on Opteron CPUs in 2004. This is a rather forgotten paper, which appeared in a mailing list in 2004. And it was about reverse engineering the AMD K8 microcode. That was the first Opteron core. And the first big discovery is that to inject modified microcode in a K8, you don't have to do anything. You simply inject it. There are no verifications whatsoever. So what is the problem? Well, the first problem is, how do you write K8 microcode? Well, not 
a big problem. What you do is you go to someone who speaks microcode, namely my father. The second problem is when you power cycle a processor, the microcode update is lost. So we have two problems, understanding the microcode and figuring out persistence. So what you do is in 2004, I handed over the microcode update file to my father. And with him, it took us 10 years to decode it. So in 10 years, uh, mainly my father figured out how the microcode update for the AMD chip worked. And in particular, what the various bits meant. And the next product was Nasty Mov. So Nasty Mov is in effect a uh, modified microcode update which allows you to patch the microcode inside the AMD K8 core and some subsequent cores, which are derived from the K8, using the original security imposed mechanism. And of course, all the magic is in the microcode. There is no magic in the update mechanism. The magic is entirely in figuring out how to write the microcode. Once you've done it, what can you do? Well, what you can do is, of course, modify instructions such as, well, I said nasty mov because you can modify mov. How do you modify mov? Well, for example, instead of mov simply moving between two registers, it might move between two registers if and only if the content of a register is a positive number. If it's a negative number, it doesn't move it. That is a useless example, but you can see how this suddenly becomes more interesting, for example, if the instruction you're modifying is a jump. So what you do next is you modify interesting instructions, and the interesting instructions you modify are the ones which deal with AMD V, VI, and AVIC. Those are all the virtualization extensions. They are the AMD equivalents of VTD, VTX, and all the IO, MMI, MMU virtualization extensions that Intel has brought online. So what happens is you think your hypervisor is being a hypervisor, but in reality, when your hypervisor makes a request for a VM entry, for example, that VM entry is being mediated by my microcode. Now, remember that these days you have multiple cores on a CPU. So what you do is in a specific example of this attack is you don't load the same microcode modification in each CPU. So let me illustrate how it works. What you do is you figure out which is the boot CPU. That's pretty easy. Once you figure out which is the boot CPU, you know that the hypervisor will uh, prefer that CPU. And you load the virtualization extension modifications of the microcode on that CPU. So when you have a VM entry by the hypervisor, you then offload the task of simulating the virtualization to another core while you decide what to modify on the core on which the VM entry has been requested. So the hypervisor is in effect being executed on a different core while you do the nasty stuff on the core which has been called. So the crux of the matter here is, and in many ways the difficulty is to keep the coherency between the various cores. But in practice, since you own the microcode, the trick is to slow down the hypervisor a little bit so that you have the time to keep the coherency. Now, another trick is to effectively take over one of the cores. So one of the examples I tried, which is probably more efficient, is to actually take over one of the cores. So what you do is, say you have a 12-core Opteron, 
what you do is you actually give 11 cores for Rio and you mask out one of the cores where you run your own operating system, which actually handles all the hacking. So when the virtual machine asks how many cores are available, you obviously answer 12. But in practice, you're running all the virtualization on 11 cores and the 12th core is used to run, for example, a BSD or whatever you prefer to virtualize all the stuff that the hypervisor thinks is being done on the real hardware. So if you will, you're virtualizing the hypervisor again via the microcode, sending over, acting effectively as a jump into the operating system that you're running on the core that you're hiding. So this is quite dirty and it's not really explained in the slides because, well, I didn't write it up because it was three o'clock in the morning when I finished the slides yesterday, but <clears throat> I should probably extend it. So the idea is effectively to steal, a to steal a core. Once you have done this, you have to appreciate that because you own the microcode, there is no way for the hypervisor to know that you've stolen a core. The only way for it to know would be to perform metrics and say, this is a bit slow for a 12 core Opteron. But how can the hypervisor know that it is slow? Because remember, how do you run the timings? Well, you run the performance registers, don't you? But who runs the performance registers? It's the core. Who owns the microcode? I own the microcode. So if you ask the performance timers to give you timings about the performance of the core, well, obviously you lie. So in a way, you have just virtualized the virtualization of the virtualized environment. And, you know, sorry, you lose. Now, this is all very exciting. It's all very cool, but we still have the power cycle problem. Because remember, all of this beautiful magic disappears the moment someone resets the CPU. You don't even have to power cycle. All you have to do is reset the CPU. And resetting the CPU is not such a hard job. As a matter of fact, you can actually reset individual cores. So what we need to do is play dirty. Now, remember that we have a weapon in our arsenal. So in theory, if we attack a machine while it is running with a hypervisor, and the IOMMU protections are active, I cannot infect any PCI device easily. So for example, my old tricks of the Jedi packet trick, et cetera, et cetera, all are blocked if your machine is running. So what you do is I need to subvert, somehow inject, persist, and then gain control. So here's the trick. The cunning plan is to take over the NIC. And in this case, it has to be a NIC on which my NIC SSH works. And I do that from the outside. So I find one of those NICs that allows me to, via a suitably crafted packet, flash the firmware from the outside or via the IPMI. Because remember that there have been several interesting IPMI takeovers, right? So I flash the firmware on the NIC and I inject an option ROM into the firmware. An option ROM is this beautiful heritage from the PC era, which is executed at boot, even by EFI. So I now either wait for a reboot or trigger a reboot of the machine. How do you trigger a reboot? That's easy. If you own the network card, you can trigger a buffer overflow in the network card drivers of the operating system simply by returning a gigantic packet when the network card isn't expecting it, Windows will crash, blue screen, reboot, we've got the server. EFI boots, it will execute the option ROM from the network card, which we've injected. The option ROM executes, injects the microcode update into the CPU, at which point the CPUs are ours, all of the cores. The microcode update obviously disables the microcode update before the operating system starts, because otherwise the microcode update from the operating system will 
override my microcode update, but we don't disable it in such a way that it will tell you unable to update the microcode. Obviously, we turn it into a null. And the microcode update now takes over the AMD virtualization extensions. Why would we want it to do that? Well, while we have the control of the machine, we might as well enable, for example, PCI to PCI transfers between different devices, which is a classic IOMMU protection. You don't want uh, direct DMA transfers between a network card and a GPU, but you do want it if you're running NIC SSH. So the first thing we do is we re-enable it. And since we own the boot process, we now have persistence. And I just finished weaponizing it as of about a month ago. So this brings us to the end of the talk on the microcode part. And now the part where we talk about the dead hand. Um, this started off as a, as a joke between uh, two mathematicians over Twitter. We were meant to meet on holiday in Sardinia. Chardon is the, is the old name of Sardinian pirates. And uh, uh, what happened is I caught pneumonia in Sardinia while on holiday, of course. And what happened is that, like all good security resource, uh, researchers, I have a dead hand system. The idea being that uh, if I were to disappear, I wouldn't want all my research to disappear with me. So I have a system whereby uh, all my research is automatically broadcast elsewhere with suitable encryption keys so that my friends can get hold of it and publish anything that they think is interesting. For example, the source code to Nick SSH and all of this stuff for Nasty Mov, which is not publicly available. So what happens is that this message, and the, this is the, the awakening, this is the message that ended up on Twitter. First of all, you can see my Unix heritage. This is the parser from TermCap. And it says, I haven't heard from you in the last 12 hours. And uh, the first thing you do is shoot for the network card takeover. That's the Nick Shot bootstrap. So what happens is that it picks a series of machines on the internet, which uh, I have uh, randomly scouted, and is injecting Nick SSH into them. Um, without permission, obviously. It then performs the NIC shot, and the GW hack means it hacks the gateways um, using a prime number of 73. That's how it picks the... Um, this is how it selects further numbers. Now, GWAC is the Google WAC. So what happens is that you pick a prime, and it uses Google whacking to pick two prime numbers to fetch the source code to the IPMI hack, which I published on several sites, which you can only reach by picking two prime numbers and put a, putting them in Google uh, using a paper which I wrote a long, a long, long time ago. Basically, you pick two prime numbers, you put them in Google, and there are only certain websites which have those two prime numbers in them. And those two prime numbers match a web, websites where the source code for the IPMI hack is found. So the dead hand system downloads the IPMI hack source code from those websites and executes it and attacks the IPMI on those websites using the NIC takeover uh, firmware. At which point, uh, at which point the, uh, there are several machines on the internet whose IPMI has been taken over using Nick SSH. Um, not something to be particularly proud of, but in theory, I'm dead, so, you know, oops. <clears throat> so then the dead hand proper starts, and it uses BNX, so the Broadcom driver, uh, the AMD microcode uh, attack, and the NVIDIA GPU SSH takeover, to infect the uh, machines that it has selected. And it also uses the Tor network to uh, speak to each other. And it distributes itself using uh, keys. 
unfortunately, you will notice that even though I'm a mathematician, the uh, initial vector, for the initialization vector for the encryption is zero 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 zero. So if anyone here is well versed in mathematics in mathematics and encryption, you will notice that I make the usual mistake of selecting a bad initialization vector for the encryption. Uh, the wiping algorithm for the machines at home is the Peter Gottman wiping algorithm, and it initiates the wipe of the machine at home. So this is starting to transfer all the data on my machines at home to the machines that I have infected with NIC SSH and the microcode flashing. And it is transferring the data via the Tor network, and it is also wiping my machines at home at the same time. And finally, once it has finished, it says the communications is now using Underworld, which is another peer-to-peer uh, -peer network, which is actually based on the old waste network. Uh, the system is live, so the keys have been sent to my friends for them to access, and the command and control system is now off, so you can no longer access it except through those special keys and the waste network. So at this point, all my machines at home have been wiped, which was actually the case. Um, all the data has been spread to machines that I have selected on the internet to be uh, infected with my systems and, uh, <clears throat> and have now been uh, selected as carriers for my precious data and the keys have been sent to my friends. So this is my personal dead hand system which uses all my hacks so far. And finally, the credits. So I thank Enno and the crew, uh, my children, Toby, and the people at The Elephant, whom I think you have figured out by now is the other chip company that I have not mentioned a single time in the whole presentation. And obviously my dad for hacking. And <coughs> the references, as you might notice, are missing. I promise to fill them up and publish the slides with all the references to all the various bits of information you need to be able to uh, reproduce my work without seeing the code, as I always do. And in the meantime, you should read the, uh, the beautiful paper produced by our friend. And uh, thank you very much. Question? Thank you very much, Arrigo. Um, are there questions? Okay, no, no questions. Okay, fine. So, um, Arrigo, thank you very much, okay. and um, I hope to see you sometime. Yeah, me too. <laughs> In Ciao. person. <laughs> okay, thanks for joining us. Um, thank you. Uh, Bye. I think we have gained about um, 10 minutes for a short break. We will continue at um, 11.30 with the next talk. So thank you. Thank you, Arrigo. Thank you. Bye. Bye.